the Lord say so.
witness. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Dwayne, Dwayne, do we have time for this? Really, Dwayne? Really? All right. Come on, you got to clap, though. Somebody's got to clap in this place. Can I get a witness that Jesus is alive? to be here on this happy resurrection day. Oh, I love to celebrate Jesus. Amen. It's good to have everybody here.
Marlana en ant Meshiacha bar elachachai Ehueana Taxon bar nashe feba himin chayil feba ananesh And as they nail me to this tree, just know the far away from me. Go, how can this be your will to have your son and my son Whatever. Whatever you see, whatever your eyes tell you has become a thing. Listen up, it's not the end. I am thinking from things to forget. Whatever your eyes tell you has become a mystery. This is not, no, no, it's not the end. 
touched by that. I mean, whew, what a great presentation. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you, Dina, for a wonderful presentation of that song and just the whole video. It just brings us to a reality that, hey, God's not dead. He's surely alive. And this morning, I want to talk about that. I, on this Easter morning, I want to talk about that because in 1966, in April, of 1966, Time Magazine came out, front cover, that said, Is God Dead? And uh, people have been asking that question even now. Many believe that, look, the Christian church, your God is dead, just like Muhammad, just like uh, Buddha, just like uh, other religions, gods. But wait a minute. Our God is not dead. He's surely alive. But he, he was crucified. History will point out Jesus did walk on this earth. History will point out, indeed, he was crucified and he died. See, your God is dead. Wait a minute, but go on with the story. That's a half truth. Go on with the story. He was buried and on the third day he was raised from the dead and he lives forevermore. Unlike Buddha, unlike Muhammad, unlike any other God. Well, your God said that he was God. That's right. He is God. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Jesus, on one occasion, said before Abraham, I am. He said he was the I am. I am is a name for God. It speaks of his eternal existence. I am literally means I exist because I exist. He always has been, is now, always will be God. Look, God cannot be dead. God cannot die. In essence, God is life. God is life. God is light. God is love. 
God is the eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. So what, well, what happened on the cross? Jesus said, I am the I am. I and the Father are one. What happened on the cross? Well, his body died. God doesn't die. His body died. The Father in his infinite wisdom 2,000 years ago prepared a body for his son to dwell in. God incarnate. And God, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, the Bible says. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Before his name was Jesus, in heaven his name was Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Fully God, fully man. Jesus came to die on that cross to pay the wages of our sin. It's his body that died. God didn't die on that cross. His body died. The Bible says that they crucified him. The Bible says that they beat him. The Bible says they mocked him. And the Bible also says that at a certain time, at 3 p.m., the Bible says after spending six hours on the cross, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit and his body died and paid that wage of sin. He took every sin, he took every curse, every disease in his own body for us. And that body was laid in a grave, and on the third day, that body of Jesus was raised from the dead, alive, glorified. Now, I want to talk about some things in a courtroom fashion, if I could, because it pleases me to do so. Now, where's Perry Mason when I need him? Amen. You all don't remember that. You're too young for that, Perry Mason. Uh-huh. But in a court, they will ask for exhibits or evidences I want or proof of life. I want to bring you three proofs of life that Jesus is truly alive. That our God is not dead. He's surely alive. Exhibit number one, people of the jury. An infallible proof. The Bible speaks of infallible proofs. An infallible proof means without error. It means absolutely correct, absolute truth, and Without any misjudgment, it's right on. So let me bring this before you. Evidence, proof of life that Jesus indeed was raised from the dead. And he's alive forevermore. God's not dead, people. Turn to somebody and say, God's not dead. He's surely alive. Here's exhibit number one. The power of truth, the power of truth, God's word. God's word is proof of life, number one. Proof of life is important. It proves someone's alive. And here's my fir first proof. The word of God says Jesus died on that cross and was raised from the dead and is alive. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. First. Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. Reminds me of a family that was on vacation in, in, in Jerusalem, in Israel. And the mother, the mother in law had a, a, a failing heart, and something terrible happened, and she died. And you know, being a Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. But there in Jerusalem, away from home, they took her body, and they said, okay, you have one of two choices. We can bury her, her here in Israel. It'll cost you $500, or we can send her back to uh, where you came from, and it'll cost you $5,000 to get the bo uh, body back there. Well, we'll go ahead and send her back home. 
Well, was there a reason for that? You want to spend that kind of money? Yeah, we hear around, we heard around here that when you bury the dead, they come back to life. I don't want to take any chances. Someone told me that right before service. I don't know if I should have told that or not. Exhibit number one, proof of life, God's word. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says, Kyle. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So according to scripture, he was crucified. He died. And according to scripture, on the third day, he was raised from the dead. That's what the word of God has to say. That he died for our sins, and he was raised for our justification. That's what the Bible says. The Old Testament prophets foretold this. One example would be in John 29, uh, chapter 20, verse 9. It's a reference to Psalm 1610. John 20, verse 9 says, For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. And that is, of course, Psalm 16.10. So it says that he must rise again from the dead, that he would be crucified, died for our sins, and then he'd be buried in the third day, raised from the dead and alive forevermore. His body glorified. Remember, God's not dead. God didn't. <laughs> God is spirit. God didn't die on the cross. He, his body died, expired. He dismissed his spirit. And when, the, and when the spirit leaves the body, the body dies. For us, when it comes to our last few moments of breath, our body dies and our, di and our spirit goes upward in the presence of God Almighty. But see, Jesus was in complete control of this. He says, no man taketh my life. He dismissed his spirit and his body died. Amen. Does that make sense to anybody here? Of course. So the prophets of old foretold that Christ, the Messiah, God's son, would die and be raised from the dead. Jesus himself declared it. Jesus himself declared that he would be turned over into wicked hands, that he would be crucified, buried, and he'd be raised on the third day. But there's one interesting time in, in the Bible where he just gave the Pharisees fits. In John 2, 19 through 21, he says, if this temple is destroyed, it will be rebuilt or raised in three days. Check this out. And they said, what? John, say, what? what? You're out of order. <laughs> Don't be talking. When <laughs> that's, that's courtroom lingo. Okay. John 2, 19 says, Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Wow, did you check that out? Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Verse 20. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? See, they didn't understand what he was talking about, and then 21 explains it. Go ahead. But he spake of the temple of his body. Of his body. Of his body being destroyed and being raised. His body being raised up. On the third day. Amen. Isn't this just flipping on a light bulb right now? Hey. And then not only did the prophets of old foretell it. Not only does the word of God. Did, did Jesus himself proclaim it. But the apostles affirmed it. Look at Acts 4.33. That Jesus is alive. That God's not dead. That he's surely alive. The apostles affirmed it. Jesus said he was God. And people say, see, you said he was God, and he died. Yes, he died, but then he was raised on the third day. Acts 4.33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. You see, preaching the cross is just half the gospel. The Bible tells us to preach the whole truth, the whole counsel of God. So along with preaching the cross, Jesus crucified, Jesus dead, we preach the resurrection, Jesus alive. See, it wasn't 
preaching Jesus dead, crucified, that got the apostles in trouble. The, the Pharisees applauded that. Good, he's dead. He's out of the way. God, your so-called God is dead. But wait a minute. He's surely alive. A and, and the apostles preach that he's alive. He's resurrected. And this is what just made religion furious and still makes religion furious today. He's alive, resurrected, literally, bodily, physically from the dead. Now, this is a tenet of our faith. This is a belief we hold dearly that cannot be compromised. Uh, if we compromise the resurrection and consider it something spiritual and not literal, bodily, physical, then Paul says that we're still in our sins and what we preach is in vain and we're a bunch of fools. But indeed, he has been raised from the dead and he is Lord. Amen. We have Bibles on this table. Every Easter we give Bible. We give, well, every service we have Bibles available. But we have them up front here uh, on the altar here that if you have a friend, if you have a friend, if first of all, if you need a Bible, we want you to have one. No cost. Freely we have, re we're not going to charge for the word of God. Neither do we charge for uh, the gospel messages that are preached in this church, they're free. You pick up whatever you want and take it. If you have friends or families that you think would receive a Bible from you, especially on Easter, if you're going to somebody's house, if you're going to see somebody later, if you have grandchildren, why not add that to their Easter basket? Put it right next to the chocolate bunny. What do you think? If you want one, and you can come up and grab one anytime during the service. Usually I don't like people moving around when I'm preaching because we're preaching the word of God. It's respectful. But if you're going to come get a Bible, you come anytime you want. Get one or two or three, but you've got to promise me you're going to give it to somebody because it would change their life. You know why? Because the Bible talks. What's it saying? God's not dead. He's surely alive. So give the word, I object, quiet, devil, overruled. Sherry's going to object. He's been accusing the brethren for ages. Hallelujah. Now, <laughs> praise God. Exhibit number two, ladies and gentlemen. Proof of life number two. The empty tomb. This is an overwhelming truth. This is an overwhelming evidence that God's not dead. That Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. The tomb is empty. Let's read a little bit of the Easter story. And by the way, that word Easter is in the Bible. It's in there one time. That's good enough for me. If I have any problem telling somebody have a great Easter, it's in the Bible. In context, it's talking about the resurrection. It's talking about that first morning. On the, the Bible says on that Easter morning, the women went to the tomb. But don't let anybody give you a hard time about it. Let God be true and every man a liar. Now, Matthew 28, 1 through 7. Matthew 28, 1 through 7 says... In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. For I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. Now we're going to see more of this story. We're going to flip over to uh, John 20, 
verses 6 through 8, but right now I want to stay here, Rhonda, please. And it says that early in the morning, that Easter morning, Mary and the women went with spices to the tomb. Mary, on her way, was thinking how they were going to roll the stone away. Remember, Jesus had died. They hurried because the Sabbath was coming. And they prepared the uh, body, and that was um, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. A lot of people don't know that. Nicodemus was with him. And uh, they prepared the body, and then they put it in that borrowed tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And then uh, many men, probably the soldiers, 16 or 20 strong, rolled that massive stone in front of the tomb to seal it. Okay, there's the picture. On Easter morning, here comes the women to the tomb. The men are in the upper room. They're concerned about being arrested and executed as a follower of Jesus Christ. So they're locked themselves in the upper room, but the women uh, came to the tomb of spices to prepare the body uh, even more. When they got there, an uh, angel of the Lord had come with a mighty earthquake, and that the angel of the Lord came down and sat upon the stone, it rolled away. Remember, it took 16 to 20 men to roll this three-ton stone into place, but yet this angel comes, and boom, it rolls out of the way. Not to let Jesus out, let me out, let me out, but to let us in to see the place where he lay was empty. The empty tomb is the most persuasive piece of evidence that Jesus is alive. God's not dead. Another thing I want to bring to your mind is that Mary came. Mary Magdalene came, of course, a follower of Jesus. Loved the Lord very much. He had delivered her from, I think, seven spirits. And uh, she uh, just was a helper to his ministry. Here Mary comes. And she sees the angel. The angel says, he's not here. I know you're looking for Jesus. He's not here. In one case, it says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? And isn't that the state of so many people today? We look for life in dead things. We look for life in dead things, material things whether it be a bottle or a syringe or some type of some type of sport or activity. We look for life in dead things. There's one place to find life, and his name is Jesus. He is life. You know, those other things we do bring pleasure and enjoyment. But listen, playing basketball will not get you to heaven. Neither will having the fastest car around. All the money in your bank will go to somebody else when you perish. I guarantee it. But you see, when you invest in a life with Jesus, you get it all. Abundant life on earth, eternity with God in heaven. Oh, that's good news. That's good news. I object. Be quiet. It's your objection overruled, devil. Pastor's talking to people on the platform. <laughs> talking. I'm going to hear about that. Remember when Mary came, she, she, the Lord told her, in another account, she actually comes to the tomb, and Jesus, she thought, was the gardener, was there, and it was the master. And when she saw him, she saw who he was, Jesus, and fell at his feet and worshiped him. And he said, go tell the others, I am risen. May I say this? And I know some people are going to get upset with me. But that's okay. Let me tell you something. Many people say, well, women shouldn't be preachers. and Women shouldn't be evangelists. Well, nobody told Jesus that. Because it was Jesus that gave the very first resurrection message to give to the men. He told that. How come all the women are shouting? He told Mary, go tell the men. I have risen. First resurrection message. First good news gospel message came from a mouth 
of a woman. I know that makes Dwayne mad. I understand that. Let's continue. Are we getting out of order? I think. John 20, verse 6 through 8. So she goes and she tells the disciples. And two of them make haste to the tomb, Peter and John. And what they saw inside, that's why we had to go to the book of John. The other gospels don't talk about this. They're more specific than what they saw. And what they saw, the very next words are, they believed. Overwhelming evidence. God's not dead. He's surely alive. John 20, verse 6 through 8 says, Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen cloth lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. He saw and believed. Saw what? He saw the linen clothes. He saw the folded napkin. Two strong pieces of evidence that Jesus is alive. Overwhelming. The grave clothes. They would use uh, wide strips of linen to put around the body, body like a mummy, you know, mummified. Uh, a dead body from the feet to the neck. And then over the head, a handkerchief or a napkin. And that's how they bury them by Jewish tradition. And they did this to our Lord and Savior as well. What they saw when they came into the tomb is a mind blower. They didn't see a bunch of linen strips, linen clothes ripped and laying down on the floor all over the place. They saw him lying in place, undisturbed, still in its folds. What happened to the body? It came out without touching a fold. The body on the inside went through the cloths, not disturbing them one bit. Like a cocoon, it was there. And when the body left, it fell flat. It blew their mind. They saw it unraveled, not cut, unlike Lazarus, who came from the tomb and had to be released. And those grave clothes torn off. And Lazarus died again of physical death. But Jesus came forth knowing that this miracle would be a sign to his followers. Look, I'm alive. And then the folded napkin that was laying across his face and wrapped around his head like a bandana. That was taken and folded. Who did that? Folded and put aside by itself, the Bible says. Well, many believe, if you look at Hebrew tradition, that when the master would dine and eat his meal, when he was finished, he would take his napkin, wipe his mouth, wipe his beard, wipe his hands, and just lay and drop his napkin on the table. This indicated to the servants, I'm finished. It's, I'm finished. I'm done. And they would come and collect the plates and, and, and clean the table. But if he took the napkin and folded the napkin and laid it in a place by itself, this was a signal, this was something powerful that went to his servants that said, I'll return. I'll be back. That he was not finished. Isn't that a good news message for Easter? That he was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he's coming back for his bride. That's us, the church. Hallelujah. This probably sent shivers and fear in the disciples when they saw these things. They knew what it meant. It meant that Jesus indeed 
was alive. And the Bible says, and they believed. Hallelujah. The third piece of evidence, the third exhibit, if you will, proof of life, is found in the eyewitnesses. The eyewitnesses. It is said by any attorney that if they could find two or three witnesses to confirm a story, it's winnable, hands down. The Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be confirmed. Well, we have more than two or three witnesses, but hundreds of witnesses. Let me show you. Acts 1-3. Acts 1-3. This proof of life, that God's not dead, Jesus is alive, is by the eyewitnesses who saw him, touched him, ate with him, spoke with him. Acts 1, 3 says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So here it talks about these infallible proofs without error, absolute truth, being seen of them, Jesus being seen of many for forty days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Then the Bible says that from the Mount of Olives, over 500 saw him. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8. It says this. We have a list of witnesses. So in just a minute, I'm going to call to the stand Peter, James, Paul, and 500 brethren. Go ahead. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Seen by Paul on Damascus Road there, remember? He had an encounter, a Jesus encounter. Seen by Cephas or Peter. Seen by James as the half-brother of Jesus. And by the way, when you see Jesus, when the resurrected Jesus touches your life, you change. Peter went from a coward who denied the Lord to the one that affirmed that he indeed is God and was crucified upside down for his faith. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who said, this is my brother, he's a lunatic. Oh, yeah. Later, he ran the largest church. In Jerusalem, as the pastor, the senior pastor, 3,000 members. You see, when Jesus touches your life, when you see Jesus, you change. 500 saw him on the Mount of Olives as he ascended right before their eyes, the Bible. We won't take the time to read it. It's Acts 1, 9 through 12. Right before their eyes, Jesus ascended into heaven. Two angels said, why are you looking toward heaven? This same Jesus that you saw us sin will come back and descend one day. They didn't see some kind of ghost ascending. They touched him. They ate with him. They saw the, the nail holes. They put their hand in his side. He was flesh and bone. And all these witnesses verify, confirm, swear this is Jesus, the resurrected Lord. God's not dead. He's surely alive. Look at John. And if Dwayne and, and the um, team could come up, please. Look at John, verses 26 through 28. At one time, Jesus, post-resurrection, at one time, Jesus showed himself to the disciples. They were in a locked room, no windows, and he just came on in. See, he was in a glorified state. And I've had people say, well, yeah, we're in a spiritual glorified state too. Oh, you are? Okay. Run full speed to that wall and let's see what happens. If you're glorified or bruisified. One day we'll have glorified bodies at the trumpet call. 
the shadow of the archangel, the command of the Lord to come up will be changed, translated in a twinkling of an eye, and will have glorified eternal bodies, incorruptible, just like his. Oh, I'm going to love going to going to In-N-Out Burger or McDonald's at the same time. Praise God. Check this out. Here, he came and showed himself to his disciples, but Thomas was not there. When Thomas came back, the disciples told him, we saw the Lord, we touched him, we talked with him, we ate with him. And, and Thomas did not believe, unless I see it, I won't believe it. And that's where many people are today. They have to see it before they believe it. If you're waiting to see something before it happens, you'll never see it happen. Jesus said, blessed is he who does not see and believe. Now check this out. John 20, 26. Go ahead. Kyle. And after eight days, again his disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hand, and reach hither my, thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not fear faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Wow. We call that a doubting Thomas. And we need to stop saying that because he's in heaven. He's no longer a doubting Thomas, but a believing Thomas. <laughs> but in another translation of the Bible, Jesus told Thomas, stop being faithless. He said, stop doubting and believe. Isn't that an Easter message for so many people? Stop doubting and believe. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop waiting for Noah's Ark to be found on Mount Ararat before you believe. Just believe. And I'm not talking about a blind step of faith. I'm talking about standing on the Word of God, listening to an empty tomb, and looking at the changed lives of all those witnesses. Well, the verdict is in. God's not dead. He's surely alive. Stop doubting. Everyone stand in this place right now. Let me ask you, why don't you stop doubting and believe God is able to put your family back together? Why don't you stop doubting and believe that God is able to touch your body and take the pain away? Stop doubting and believe that your family can be saved and that husband can be saved and your children can be saved. Stop doubting and believe he can, he can, God can get your children back home safe and sound. Stop doubting and believe he is the Messiah. He died on that cross and he was raised on the third day for you and for me that we might live forevermore. Stop doubting and believe. I rest my case. God's not dead. Let me ask you, with, with every head bowed, let me ask you. And we're going to close with God's not dead. Let me ask you. And if you need a Bible, there's plenty up here. Feel free to come. I told you. Come and take as many as you want to give to people that need the good news message. God's not dead. He's surely alive. If there's somebody here this morning, you want to open your heart to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens that door and invites me in, I will come into him and sup with him and change him all things brand new.
is there somebody here this morning on this Easter morning that would say yes to the empty tomb? Yes to the eyewitnesses. Yes to the word of God. Raise your hand right now. Raise it up high. Yes. I see your hand. I see your hand. Back in the back. I see your hand. Somebody else. This is the moment. This is the time of decision. I'm telling you. God's not dead. He's surely alive. And he's alive for you. In Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. By your blood, I pray. I confess with my mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe in my heart. God raised him from the dead. Now I know according to your word. And that empty tomb. And those eyewitnesses. I'm saved. A child of God. Alive forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Somebody get crazy. Somebody just get crazy in here. Salvation has come to God's house on this Easter day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I pray a blessing, an Easter resurrection blessing upon every household. Lift your hands. Lift your hands right now. Every household a blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. May every home prosper. May every home be filled with God's love, joy, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Okay, guys, Hallelujah. My drummer had to leave on an emergency, so I need you guys to help me do this.